Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The show is about to begin. Welcome to the podcast, conscience that made us, interviews and stories, tales from the bus, we love taking you back to when it all went down, the greatest live shows and that cheering crowd sound, it's concerts, concerts that made us, concerts that made us dot com. Elon Rubin, you're very welcome to Concerts That Made Us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a, a real pinch me moment now to get you on the podcast, so uh, <laughs> I'm very excited. Well, likewise, thanks for having me. So uh, to date, you've had an absolutely amazing career that I'm sure some rock stars twice your age would probably kill for. Mm-hmm. But before we get into it, do you want to tell the listeners a bit about your solo project? I know your song Talk, Talk, Talk is going to be playing us out this evening. Yeah, well, uh, it's my first solo single, if you will. I released music for quite a while under a moniker, and I decided during the pandemic to have a semblance of a fresh start and start releasing music under my name and not having anything to hide behind. And Talk, Talk, Talk is the first single released as Elon Rubin. Right. So I play, I uh, wrote, played and sang everything on the recording, um, as is my usual MO. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a, it's a song I'm very proud of. And it's just a taste of what's to come. It's always difficult figuring out what the first impression should be. <laughs> but I did want to make it known that it would be different to what I've released in the past. So that's that. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, what made you to, the, what made you decide to kind of take the leap to use your own name and make it a bit different from the past? It was, it was a combination of things, but really one thing that just continued to baffle me as time progressed was that although I wrote, played and sang everything and made no secret that, um, the new regime, which is the moniker I wrote under was me, people still had a tough time connecting the dots there. And I'm like, well, this is, this is definitely a disservice I didn't foresee. And there was, there was a while where I was like, well, it's already, it's too late now to kind of change, but you know, it's never too late. And it was a sort of eye opening moment just with the world kind of getting flipped on its head where I was just like, you know what, I don't want to come out of this with a year of quote unquote wasted time. And the reason why I say quote unquote is because I really made the most of the pandemic lockdown um, personally and and in terms of productivity. But I was like, I don't want to come out of this and pick up where I left off. I want to come out of this and start something new. Yeah. Yeah. And that those two things were the deciding factor. But going back to what I was starting my response with, I mean, I would literally open up a show as the new regime for Angels and Airwaves, which is one of the bands I play drums for, I would then go and play drums on the very same stage 15 minutes later. (laughs) And after that, I would get a variety of comments from people who would see me and be like, you look like the singer in the new regime, or you look like the (laughs) drummer in Angels and Airwaves. And I'm like, okay, this, this is, this has to change. Yeah. And uh, so once again, pandemic kind of, opened my eyes and I thought, yeah, it's, I'm doing myself a disservice and I'm proud of what I do. So there's nothing to hide behind. Exactly. Exactly. You kind of remind me of, uh, you've surely come across it where a lot of people online say that the drummer from Nirvana looks an awful lot like the lead singer of the Foo Fighters. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Of, of, of course he, uh, has achieved monumental success, Mm. which is, uh, phenomenal and um something to strive for yeah exactly exactly we'll uh we'll move on to your uh your career so to speak sure what Hit me. what would be your earliest musical memory my earliest musical memory uh as a musician or just 
music in general music in general um what comes to mind is um a dabbling with magical mystery tour right, right. i don't I, I don't i mean i i was about to say i don't know why my dad is practically a beatles fanatic which is why it's in my blood mm. but um and the beatles are obviously one of my favorites today but I did recall having a moment with um, hit a CD of it, you know, because this was in the '90s. I was born in '88. Of course, he. I mean, he was the uh, type of Beatles fan where he had all the Capitol releases because that's what came out in America. But then he ordered all the Parlophone releases from a, a record shop, so he had both. Yeah. And uh, yeah, when everything was kind of transferred to CD, he got the CDs and that's that was my introduction. And I don't really recall how or why, but I just remember looking at that CD quite a bit. And uh, I'm the Walrus stuck out to me in particular. And it's a weird thing because my Beatles obsession did not start there. Right. But it was just in the house. Fast forward a couple of years later, at least, and the very first thing that my dad taught me was the fill that comes into I Am The Walrus when, when Ringo makes oh. his introduction to the song. And then fast forward a few years later after that, because it still hadn't hit me, I then became a, pretty much a Beatles fanatic in my early mid-teens. Hmm. It tends yeah. to happen around then, doesn't it? It's like you... Uh... You're always aware of the Beatles, but when you hit your teen years, they really sink in and you realize how important they were. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, pardon me if I, if, if you already know this, because it's hard for me to get through a musical conversation and not reference either the Beatles or Led Zeppelin. But <laughs> with Led Zeppelin, that was a knock me over the head moment. And mm. the reason why that influence has been so multidimensional with me is... Because initially, my dad turned me on to Led Zeppelin as a drummer. Right. And song one, album one, the drums are amazing and they're fascinating. And that pulls you in. Hmm. Then you have the, the simpler sort of surface level of just enjoying great riffs and a great singer. <laughs> then you dive into actually understanding what the songs are doing. Then you get into a deeper level of kind of like subdividing all the different elements that make the whole as great as it is. Mm. So I was hit. Uh, I've literally been obsessed with Led Zeppelin since I was eight years old, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I, I give all my credit to Ringo, but there wasn't that primal attraction to the drumming of Ringo. Mm. Ringo is like an acquired appreciation. It's kind of like it's there. It does a great job. But if you really want to appreciate it, you kind of need to peel back some layers. It's not as apparent yeah. as, uh, or as obvious, I should say, as, you know, Bonham on good times, bad times. So I digress, but let's continue. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, the very first single or album you ever purchased. You know, that I actually purchased, I mm. don't, um, Oh, God, I actually don't recall. But what I will say is that um, growing up, there would be an album would once I was fully into music as a as a mature nine year old or whatever it was, <laughs> um, CDs kind of became a gift at uh, in a holidays or whatever. So I do recall getting Wheels of the Fire. Uh -huh. um, you know, no surprise. I had a 16 minute drum solo on it and. <laughs> My dad liked cream and said, you should listen to cream. So uh, <laughs> still love cream to this day. Uh, yeah, I do recall the the 90s um, Led Zeppelin box set. That was like a holy grail moment to me. I'm like, oh, oh my God, so. I am literally holding everything they've ever done in one box. That was like <laughs> mind boggling to me. And uh, like I say, uh, I'm already sounding redundant, but... <laughs> I remember being stuck at home, sick one day, just feeling terrible. And my dad was like, you know what? I'm going to step out of the house for just a second. And he came back with what was brand new then, which was the Led Zeppelin BBC sessions. Oh, man. 
And so all these things, obviously within the same world, but these were like the new things to me that I was getting, but they were gifts more so than me kind yeah. of saving up some cash and going to warehouse or Sam Goody or whatever the hell was around at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. You, uh, you definitely had a very good introduction to great music. I almost feel I, like you, you were set up that you couldn't fail when it comes to your music tastes or being a musician. <laughs> You know, uh, yeah, I, I'm very fortunate with that. I, what I do find funny is that I've met people, either my age or older than me, who eventually end up where I started because I had the the guidance, hmm. and I never had. This may sound disappointing to some of your listeners or viewers, but I never had a like a rebellious bone in my body, so it wasn't really? like. I don't want to listen to my parents' music. It's like, no, this is great, so I'm going to listen to it. And a lot of the people I've encountered either weren't introduced to it and discovered it later on in life or made a conscious effort to avoid it. Right. Until, until, late, yeah, until later years, they're like, you know what? Uh, this is actually a really good song. It's like, no shit. <laughs> there you go. Oh, man. man. Yeah, so it's, it's, people are funny. They are. They sure are. Before mm. we get into the concerts you've played, so what's yeah. uh, what was the first concert you ever attended? Oh, God, I'm so bad at this, and I do apologize because I know that was no the problem. premise the premise of this interview. <laughs> um, it's kind of... Um, it's kind of a... I mean, it, it's definitely a blur, or else I would have a definitive answer for you. Right. Um, my... My parents were always somewhat of the concert goer type and they they were more so you know in their 20s probably um you know teens and 20s maybe a bit into their 30s so I have no doubt that perhaps I was taken to something cuz I do have this this very vague recollection of seeing somebody perform on stage in a what appeared to me then to be a sizable venue. I mean, for all I know, it was a tiny stage with a hundred people watching, but, <laughs> but at the time, you know, at the time it seemed like, okay, I, I'm at a concert. This is what a concert is, but it all sort of happened to me as both a viewer, listener, music fan and musician. So pretty much when I started playing drums, my oldest brother i'm the youngest of three um pretty much drafted me into his his high school band so nice. there's a big blur between either watching a show or playing a show hmm. and i started very early on you know eight nine years old i was already performing and by say 11 years old a couple of the a few of the shows were fairly sizable so it's just there's kind of a, a blur there yeah yeah i can understand you know but by 11 i was already kind of i had played my first warp tour and that's um <laughs> that's an experience that stands out because that would be the first sort of festival i had ever been to yeah and that's at 11 years old so it's there once again, it's in a hazy part of my memory. And, you know, the, the, the following year after that, we played um, a week on the Warp Tour. And then two years after that, we played three weeks. So, Jeez. you know, that it, it was never my, my music per se, but it was a fantastic experience hmm. getting to play in front of people, kind of feeling that competitive spirit where because obviously i wasn't playing on a main stage at that point in fact i was playing on the smallest stage most of the time <laughs> but but there was that sort of like competitive grit that was instilled where it's like how do we get more people to watch us instead of whoever else is around yeah and um you know one thing progressed to another and i kept touring more and more and more but i'm sure we'll get into that so again i digress and i had um an inarticulate and uh imprecise first concert <laughs> right okay okay <laughs> so um the uh the first professional gig that really made you feel like yes this is what i want to do with my life and i'm actually starting to get places what was that mm -hmm. 
well, that gig would not have been a professional gig by any means. Okay. Because <laughs> it, it's 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 many years, or usually it's many years before you have a professional gig. The first time I ever performed in public was at a battle of the bands in the high school gymnasium when I was eight or nine. And um, that was that was a really fun moment. I didn't have, you know, a semblance of, of nerves or stage fright or anything. And as a result of that, and the preceding concerts were, they, they just did a great job of making me feel comfortable performing in front of others. Mm. It was kind of embedded in me from such a young point. And I really think it's a, it's an advantage when being on stage is one of your comfort zones. Yeah. Yeah. It's you a know, very and, rare thing. Yeah. And, and I, I can imagine how difficult it would be for somebody who say hasn't been on stage until they're, I don't know, 15, 16, 17, which is usually when you kind of have that first moment. And I think people either gravitate towards it or they don't, but not even really having a precise start time and just kind of looking back and be like, Oh, I've already been doing this for a few years, hmm. you know, cause I don't recall what I felt like at the time. I just recall enjoying it. Yeah. yeah. So that must've been a very formative experience for me. Like to this day, I despise the hour before a show starts. Really? I hate it. I have all, <laughs> I have all this like, anxious energy where I just want to like sprint out onto the stage and just start playing. So the whole <laughs> counting down, like, okay, hour, half an hour, 10 minutes. I'm like, come on, this is agony. Like, let's just go. Yeah. And then the second I'm, I'm either playing drums or I have a guitar on me and I step up to the microphone. I'm like, Oh, now I can relax. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. If you could bottle that feeling now and sell it to people. You'd be yeah, a billionaire. That'd be, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> Not a bad idea. Exactly. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, do you reckon it was a bit of a childhood naivety that uh, you didn't realize there was such a thing as stage fright and you were so comfortable or was it just you naturally, agra- you naturally gravitated towards performing? Uh, I'm sure it was a combination of the two. Because, I mean, to this day, I'm somewhat shy. I used to be a lot worse as a kid, particularly a young kid. So in terms of of being naive and just doing it, I'm sure that was a big part. But at the same time, I think it was, I loved playing drums. I'm just going to play drums over here right now. (laughs) And it, it was very natural. So, yeah. Right. We'll, uh, but we'll... I, I, I started sorry to cut you off. I, I remembered I was going to say something is that for shy people, there is there, there can be a sort of um, duality of the shy person and when the shy person kind of comes alive. And I'm sure it was a huge uh, asset to actually have my instrument in front of me. So it's very easy to kind of feel isolated. Mm. even though you're in front of other people, you know, you're, there, there's a, there's still a barrier between yeah. you and the crowd. So I think it was easy for me to sort of just get into my own zone, do my own thing and kind of in a way shut people out. I mean, I've always been somewhat animated and the older I got, I became more of a performer mm. as a drummer, but um, ha- having my instrument in front of me and around me, definitely i would imagine made that transition into being a performer easier yeah yeah that's actually very interesting i never thought of that because it's like almost a protection from the crowd you know Mm -hmm. yeah that's that's fascinating now we'll um we'll skip forward to the last gig you've played when would that have been that would have been um sometime mid-march right uh my my band, the New Regime, was opening up, or supporting Silver Sun Pickups over here in the U.S. And obviously, before the tour started, there were rumblings of COVID nineteen coronavirus. However, they wanted to brand it at the time. It's it's yeah. funny to me how these things kind of like have a name and then it changes into something else. But um, <laughs> even though it's the same thing, yeah. But yeah. Um, 
so there were it was obviously somewhat known but nobody was worried about it and it was shocking to me especially in hindsight how within a week and a half it went from ah nothing to worry about we'll finish out this tour and we'll see how everything goes to then being like we're probably only going to be able to do two more shows Right. To literally the next day pulling up to the venue and realizing that nobody is loaded in and that was it. Oh, man. So it was in like an exponential growth of shutdown. Mm-hmm. And I live on the West Coast uh, of the U.S. I'm I'm currently in San Diego right now. I'm actually, um, as I was telling you before we started recording, I'm down here rehearsing with Angels and Airwaves. So I'm actually staying with my parents. This is my illustrious childhood bedroom and uh, but I, I live in LA and I have a bunch of gear so it's literally driving from Knoxville Tennessee which is a far way over east from San Diego Los Angeles mm-hmm. and I was like well this show is not gonna happen um, time to drive home oh. so so the uh, three or four of us who are in the van drove straight back without stopping dropped the gear off in San Diego and then we all lived in LA. We all drove to LA and, and thought at that time we thought, well, let's see how this plays out there. Everyone's claiming to reschedule in July. And yeah. obviously we know how that went. Yeah. But um, yeah. so that was my, my last, well, the, the show that never was, was Knoxville. I don't remember what the last show <laughs> before Knoxville was, yeah. but I'm, I'm sure we could find it if we wanted to mm. research a little bit, but yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh... It must have been a weird feeling to drive back though and the uncertainty of what was going to happen. And, you know, little did you think it would be over a year oh, yeah, there was live gigs, you know? Yeah, well, what, what's funny is, you know, it takes quite a few tanks of gas to get from Tennessee to California. Mm. And at that point, when you realize, okay, this is probably something to worry about. And we've been at merch booths and we've been meeting people. Then you get into this zone where it's like, okay, well, now that that's over, we need to drive straight back and we're going to need to get gas, but we're going to like ration hand sanitizer and make sure we're all washing our hands as much as possible and avoiding people and all this stuff. And yeah, by the time I got home, even within that, one and a half to two day period, my hands were like ashen white, practically <laughs> peeling from the amount of sanitizing I was doing. Yeah. I, I felt like my hands looked like the emperor in star Wars, just like <laughs> pasty, what pastier than I, I usually look, but mm. my hands were just like flaky and disgusting. Oh, but, man. <laughs> yeah. So it, it was a bit eerie because all of a sudden you're looking at people and you're kind of like, mm. you stay over there. I'll yeah. be over here, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's been a weird time. It's almost like mm-hmm. some sort of a end of days film, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, which is you know, and I'm, I wouldn't necessarily classify myself as twisted, but the first two, <laughs> the first movie and the first book that I read, starting with the movie, was Twenty Eight Days Later. I'm like, this seems like a good thing to watch right now. Mm-hmm. And then the first book I read, because I am a, a history fan, I was like, you know that. That book about the uh, the Black Death that has been sitting on my bookshelf, I'm going to read it right now. Oh, and, perfect uh, timing. <laughs> yeah. It's like no, no better time than now. Let's see what they used to deal with. Yeah. So. <laughs> Were you uh, starting to look around for them old plague doctor suits just to be uh, ready? Uh, <laughs> no. I wanted one of those um, those masks with the long noses that they mm. used to put herbs in to purify the death. But... Um, <laughs> I didn't, you know, now they just look festive. So mm. <laughs> carnival or something. But yeah. 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 Is there any uh, upcoming gigs on the card? On the cards? Anything set in stone? There, there sure are. Uh, the reason why I'm in San Diego rehearsing right now is because, um, dauntingly enough, the first show that Angels and Airwaves has in over a year and a half is Lollapalooza at the end of this month. Oh, man. So uh, it's going to be a great one. I'm really looking forward to it. Fingers crossed. I hear this this Delta variant is uh, a pain in the ass, mm. to, say the le- to say the least. But um, yeah, we actually had our first rehearsal yesterday. So it's um, already got, you know, I don't know if you can see, but I'm already doing some, already doing some damage to the hands here. But 
It's part of part of being ready. Exactly. Exactly. It's, not, it's like it's like my preemptive boot camp. It's like, oh, if we're gonna start playing shows, I need to purposely tear the shit out of my hands so that my calluses come back. <laughs> I imagine it's like when you work out at the gym. You know, I don't know what day. that's like. I don't know what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know myself anymore. It's been quite a few years, but uh, I remember I used to wake up and if I wasn't in pain the next day, I thought it was mm. a wasted workout. So I imagine rehearsing is the same. If you don't have the blisters, it was wasted. <laughs> yeah, no, I in, in you are totally right. Um, I, I do feel I'm allergic to working out because it's the only time I'm thoroughly impatient. <laughs> I can do the most boring stuff for hours okay put me on an elliptical machine or a bike or something at the gym in hours or no no fuck hours i'm never in the gym for hours <laughs> minutes feel like hours and i then get in this train of thought where i'm like i know there's something i could be doing better with my time right now <laughs> like i'm literally running in place sweating mm. this sucks so I do feel, you know, the upper body soreness from from playing, which is great. Mm. But uh, the only athletic thing I, I take joy in is uh, is playing tennis, which is a fairly recent thing I've picked up. It's been about four years. But in doing that, I, I take lessons every Thursday and my teacher runs me around to the point where the next day I feel like somebody just beat me severely. <laughs> and I'm like... That was a good lesson. <laughs> yeah. I've heard before that you're quite passionate about tennis. All right. Four I years, am. though. That's kind of a kind of late in life to start, if I, you don't mind me saying. No, it's it's one of my one of my newfound regrets in life. <laughs> um, and I don't understand it because my my two older brothers played and they were, you know, competitors in their young age. They never like had aspirations to be a professional tennis player, but it was a part of their upbringing. And uh, I mean, we all got baseball as well, but I was put in baseball and I played for four years. I did thoroughly enjoy it. But even at that age, I'm like, this pales in comparison to music. This is yeah. this is something I'm doing during my kid years. <laughs> but but tennis is one of those things you do into old age and it's it's a lifelong game and passion and i'm so disappointed that i i mean i can't say i was disappointed that my parents didn't put me into it but i'm disappointed that i didn't have the interest hmm. and recently something you know four years ago watching a match saying like you know what that looks like fun and it obviously seems like great exercise like i'm gonna try it for that but then hmm. i actually just fell fell in love with the sport and it's the it's the only sport I care about. You yeah, know, I like yeah. the I like the one on one aspect. You know, mm. best one on the court wins. There's nobody <laughs> on the team to blow it for everybody else. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I wouldn't know the most about tennis myself now, but uh, mm. are you any good? How good are you? I will. I would. I will say this. Um, I think I'm good for the amount of time that I've been playing. Mm. Um, I am always trying to get better and better and better. Um, so I'm constantly improving, Good but, answer. uh, I, I enjoy it a lot, which is the most important, but, exactly. Uh, yeah, I definitely say I'm decent, but I'm always trying to get as good as I possibly can. Hmm. Yeah. Like everything in life, I suppose. Exactly. So, uh, we'll move on to, I think this might be an interesting one. The worst experience you've had playing a concert. Um, well, I will say that I, one of them is coming to mind right now. Um, I was going to say that anytime a mistake is made, which is, I'm I'm speaking frankly with you. I'm not being immodest. I very, very, very rarely make mistakes. Mm. I mean, years in between one mistake to the next. <laughs> really? Honestly. Um you know, I never, a lot of mistakes come from either being, uh, psyching yourself out or being unprepared. Mm. I don't get psyched out and I always put a thorough amount of time into being prepared. <laughs> so if a mistake occurs, it's literally like a freak accident of like, I can't believe that just happened. It, that shocked me. <laughs> but there's been, um, so... Back in 2009, this is what's coming to mind right now. 
there was um at that point in time nine inch nails was going away for a while or indefinitely didn't know whether that was the last show right and we closed off the run with doing four shows in la at different size venues so if i'm not mistaken we did uh, echoplex which was the smallest one we then did henry fonda we did the will turn we did the palladium but i want to say will turn was the last show of that run mm-hmm. and there was so much energy going into that show. It was also a ridiculously long set list. I think it was like 38 songs or something like that. Jesus. And I'm not exaggerating. Like a few encores, if I recall properly. And and some guests came out to perform with us. But song number one, we're playing Somewhat Damaged, which is in a time signature of 9-8, which is not all that common, especially in that, that kind of music. So... Mm. You know, you're either, I take it you're a musician. I am somewhat a musician. Okay. So, you know, if you're in three, four, it's very easy to kind of get into the groove. If you're in six, eight, it's kind of double that. But nine, eight to me is slightly odd because the whole thing, by the time a measure turns around, it feels a little odd because Mm. it's almost feels like it's three bars in one, depending on how fast it is. But, um, yeah, so somewhat damage is in nine eight, nine four, if some music theory guy wants to argue with me or something. <laughs> but I'm just gonna put that out there. But I must have had more energy than usual, and I was just kind of swinging my arms more than usual, I guess, because this was the first and only time that I like went to hit the snare and I pulled my in ears clean out of my head. Oh man. <laughs> and you go from hearing isolated sound of everything that's going on to then just hearing chaos and not hearing any music whatsoever. Oh, shit. <laughs> and that was awful. And considering how on the beat Nine Inch Nails has to be, let alone mm. with playing a 9-8 with, with this song, I wanted to just shrivel up and die. But fortunately... <laughs> there's a bit of the song where the drums cut out for a few bars. And by that point, I was able to get my in-ears back in. Right. And I was counted back in and we kind of locked back in. But for that moment, I'm like, this is done. This is a fucking train wreck. And I don't know how I'm going to get back. Fortunately, I did. Nothing else went wrong for the rest of the show. But that was terrifying. I could imagine. Jesus. You'd want the world to just swallow you up. You know? Yeah. And, you know, that, that kind of gets you ready for moments where the monitor desk decides to shut off or there's some kind of power issue because there's obviously a lot of wattage and mm. amps, whatever you want to call it, going through everything. And there have been moments where either the PA shuts off and <laughs> our monitor desk is working. So we're all rocking out thinking we're sounding great, but nobody's hearing us <laughs> or or, or we've had the opposite where the PA is on, but all the monitors shut off. And then we're like panicking, like, do we keep playing what's happening? And that's yeah. the, all of those things are just awful moments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did um, did anyone else on stage notice the little mishap? Did Trent or anyone else notice? Yeah, everybody noticed because the, the kind of the band – And the click where it's starting to do this. Ah, right. (laughs) And it's like, what's going on here? And then, boom, everything was back in sync and Mm. went well. Um, But, hey, like I said, freak accident. I couldn't have have had any sort of um, foresight for that one. True, true. It must have been, um, I know you've probably spoke about this time and time again, but... Getting to play it with Nine Inch Nails, being in Nine Inch Nails, must have been one of the moments in life where it's a, a real holy shit moment. Like, It certainly know. was. It certainly was. Um, and it was a series of holy shit moments because, you know, I was, I was made aware that in 2007 at um, first was Leeds, actually, but I'm talking about the Reading and Leeds festivals. Mm. But it, but at Leeds in particular, I was told that Trent was watching 
me play in the band that I was playing in at the time. And I was really surprised by that for two reasons. One, I didn't know Trent. Right. And second of all, I'm like, there's no way in hell that Trent's on the stage to watch this band. There's just no way he would like this band ever. <laughs> and that was kind of that. I was like, well, that's cool that that Trent was watching. And at that time, Josh Fries was playing with Nine Inch Nails. And I've known Josh for quite a few years at this point. So I, I didn't really think anything of it or make anything of it but a less a less than a year later i received an email directly from trent saying hey uh trent from orange nails here uh, i saw you play at reading your leads last year and i thought you were exciting to watch and i'm looking for a drummer and i think you would you'd be great if you're interested in auditioning i'm like yes <laughs> so that was that was holy shit moment number one mm. and um I was, of course, very excited, and I was like, "This is an opportunity. Let's let's do this." I'm, yeah, I'm ready. He sent me the songs. Uh, he sent me the songs. You know, I actually may be skipping a step because okay. um, I had a friend. I uh, still have a friend. We're actually business partners in the drum company that I play called Q Drum Co. But he, I, I saw that, uh, so pardon my blurring of the chronology. <laughs> so Trent saw me play in 2007. About a year later, it was announced that Josh Freeze was leaving the band. Right. Okay. So I was like, shit, I need to, to take advantage of this opportunity and, and find a way in. Hmm. So I spoke to my friend who had been teching for Nine Inch Nails for a few years at that point. And I'm like, we got to find a way in here. Can <laughs> you send me some live tracks or something that I can play along to? And I filmed myself in the garage. This was this was Halloween of 2008. I remember that specifically for some reason. Probably because people were like, oh, we're going to go have fun. And I'm like, I'm going to get to work because yeah. this is important here. And so I filmed myself playing Letting You in March of the Pigs. And uh, I was wearing a queen shirt in the video, which I think may have helped because I recall him commenting on the queen shirt, Trent's a queen right. as well. So I'm like, yes. <laughs> but um, we never really talked about that video, though, because weeks went by and then I got an email from him. So mm. now I've now I've put everything in proper context. Yeah. But at that point, I wasn't sure if he saw the video or if it was just fate, if we'll call it. Like, yeah. well, I need, a new, I need a new drummer, and I saw that guy last year, so <laughs> let's get in touch with him. I, I don't know. I, even I, I know he saw it, but basically when we spoke, I don't know what basically made him email me. And mm. Long story long, <laughs> he sent me a list of songs. I learned them went out uh, to, I want to say New Hampshire, so East Coast of the U.S., and Nails was on the Lights in the Sky tour, so I auditioned at a sound check. Um, I will, I've never talked about this, so okay. considering I've been so bad at answering a lot of your very simple questions, <laughs> I will... I, I think I now feel comfortable enough. I mean, the thought of this story has made me feel ill on many occasions. Okay. But um, I basically had a weird mishap and flare up with my arm that I had never, ex never experienced prior to that. And I had never experienced it since. Hmm. And it took me a really long time to piece together what happened. But basically, I was auditioning. It was going great. And then my arm seized up in a way where I could barely hold on to the drumstick. But I was actually looking at my arm and it was visibly swollen. Like it freaked me out a little Jesus. bit. Because it wasn't just like, oh, I'm tense or I need to loosen up. It's like something mm. is physically happening to my arm that I've never experienced before. And at that point, we were playing so well together and I could tell that he was into it and the band was into it. I I made a serious gamble that paid off, hmm. but I went up to Trent. I'm like, Hey man, keep in mind, we 
pretty much just met. And I was like, hey, man, um, I don't know what's going on with my arm right now. Mm -hmm. But, and I, you know, explained what was going on. I was like, it's, it's visibly swollen. Like I'm barely holding onto a drumstick. I was like, I'm going to keep playing. Right. But I just want you to know in case somehow it affects my playing. Like mm. I'm right in at that point, he was like, Hey, thanks for telling me. Um, this so this hasn't happened before. I'm like, never. I'm like, but let's keep going. He's like, you know what? I, I don't worry about it. Like everything was was really good. Um, let me get back to you in just a second. So he went and met with the rest of the band, who at that time was just um Robin and Justin Melville Johnson. And Alessandro Cortini was in the band at the time, but he wasn't at that sort of audition process because yeah. he was also leaving the leaving the band. So at this point when they're meeting, I'm like, did I just ruin my life right now by <laughs> by like by like trying to get ahead of this potential problem? Yeah. And um, so it was an agonizing few minutes. And Trent came back out. He's like, we all thought you did a great job playing. Would you mind um, coming with us to the next city and we'll just kind of finish off the songs that we didn't get to play today? I'm like, yes, no problem. <laughs> Let's go. He's like, cool. Watch the show tonight. Uh, tour manager will tell you about, you know, bus call, why not ride with us on the bus. And then we'll just finish up the songs and sound check tomorrow. And I'm like, thank God. Okay, great. Oh man. Finish the rest of this, finish the rest of the songs. They had one last little chit chat and it was like, we'd be honored if you joined the band. I'm like, Oh, thank God. Okay, great. <laughs> and that was, that was that moment. But literally the thought of that, considering I've been with the band for like 12 years now, the thought of that experience has literally turned my stomach on many occasions. Oh. <laughs> and, and basically, cause I told you, it took me months to figure out what happened. Hmm. I somehow went through 20 years of my life without ever having blood drawn. Really? Right. Okay. Yeah. And I went to the doctor the day before I flew out to audition. Hmm. And I went to the doctor for something else. And they're like, you know, I realize you've never had blood drawn before. And I wouldn't feel like a good doctor unless I at least did like a basic panel. And I, I didn't think anything of it. I'm like, I don't like needles, but you're the doctor. If you got to mm. do it, you got to do it. So, you know, I cowardly closed my eyes and I was like, go take it. And, um, <laughs> and they always say, stay off your arm. Don't really use it much. And by tomorrow you should be back to normal. I did not heed the doctor's advice and mm. I proceeded to play drums all day. <laughs> and then, and then I took a five hour flight, which does a bunch of stuff to your, circulation yeah and your your blood flow the next day i audition in what was literally a freezing cold arena <laughs> and i was so amped up that i was just at like 120 percent of just like let's go yeah yeah and all of that just led to my left arm going i shouldn't have done all that <laughs> literally the all, definition uh, of overdoing it <laughs> yes, yes. I, my arm almost fell off of my body, and I was like, "It doesn't matter. I'm going to keep going. I'm, it, I have to." And um, yeah, so look, it, it appears that one day shy of my 33rd birthday, I can talk about a traumatizing moment when I was 20, and this is the first time I've ever told that story to somebody who's not in my my inner circle, if you will. Well, thank you. I truly feel honored. Thanks a million for uh, <laughs> sharing it. Ah, my pleasure at this point. Hopefully it was entertaining. It was, it was. I'm sure the, the listeners are going to love it. Happy birthday, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know how, but 33 next year. It's, I mean, tomorrow. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> time's a blur, right? What's, what, exactly. What, what is. is time? Since March of last year, what is time really? That's it. That's it. Yeah. It's just <laughs> blurs by. Yeah. We'll, um, we'll get on to your best concert experience. That Never is had. a no-brainer. That is a no-brainer. <laughs> 2007, I was one of the lucky few 20,000 who watched Led Zeppelin perform at the O2 Arena. Oh, man. Yes. And I actually had two, my two greatest concert-going experiences that, last, that year of, of 2007, which I never thought I would ever experience. Led Zeppelin, of course, The Almighty, 
and I saw the police on their reunion tour. No way. Two bands I never, ever thought I would see for obvious reasons. Mm. And I was uh, lucky enough to go to both of those shows. Oh, man, that is a... Uh, I don't... I'm speechless. Getting to see the well, two of them now is... Oh. Yeah, and, and the police one was out of the blue. I was invited to go a few hours before the show. And I was like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, great. Led Zeppelin... I was very fortunate enough to get a, a heads up because I knew or I was playing with a band who was managed by the same company who's managing Jimmy Page. And basically that whole roster um, was able to, I mean, it was like, a, it was a benefit as a tribute concert for Ahmet Erdogan. So there was, um, you had the ability to buy tickets, which were phenomenal. I mean, Brian May was sitting in front of me and Brian May is not going to get a <laughs> shitty seat. So, yeah. so, it was amazing and shockingly nobody in the band I was with who was able to get tickets wanted to go. So I bought them up and went with my family oh, man. and I went to London just for the show. <laughs> and it's honestly the only time I've ever gotten choked up to music and really? um, which may seem weird. Um, you know, I've been called a robot in the past, but um <laughs> But, um, I mean, clearly I love music, but like music hasn't made me cry or anything. I haven't, but, but watching three of my superheroes in mm. person performing, which is something I never thought I would see. I had a very, very real moment of like, like, oh my God, I, I, yeah. I never thought I'd see this. And it was, it was incredible for me. Oh, I could imagine. Jesus. Uh, the amount of people that would have traded places with you right there. Well, maybe not sitting behind Brian May because the hair and the hair. everything. Yeah. 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 So whoever was sitting behind Brian May and me must have been really bummed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. But um, it was incredible. And if I'm not mistaken, I think there were 20 million applicants for tickets. I'm not a bit surprised. Yeah. I'll cut this bit out, but I have to ask, what band was it that didn't want to go to the concert? Lost Profits. I was thinking. <laughs> Doesn't <Yeah>. surprise me. <laughs> me neither. But yeah, I was like, you guys don't want to go see Led Zeppelin? Mm. What is wrong? Like, I'm like, can I buy your tickets? They're like, if you want to go for it. I'm like, Pfft. oh man. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but like, even as musicians, every musician wants to see them. They are gods. Like, yeah, well, they fall into the category of. That's not cool music. And then I'm sure now they're probably like, you know what? Led Zeppelin's amazing. Maybe. I, I, I know uh, the the few who, at least one of the ones who I got along with best at the time, couldn't give a shit about the Beatles. Like he'd rather listen to the jam than the Beatles. And oh. sure, sure. Listen to the jam. You're not going to compare. Paul Weller wouldn't compare the jam to the Beatles. <laughs> and it wasn't until the guy was in his like, mid late thirties and like having a daughter where he's probably like, you know what? The Beatles are really good. It's like, yeah, yeah. Kind of been missing out ever since you've been alive, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and Hey, don't get, don't get me wrong. There are plenty of things that I have missed out on, um, potentially out of ignorance, but I've always been the type of person where when I get into something, I'm so obsessive about it mm. that I don't care about anything else. Yeah, yeah, I would rather listen to the one band or the one album over and over and over again until I feel, excuse me, like I'm ready to get into something else. Yeah, I can I can relate to that myself. I'd have one of them yeah. personalities where when I get interested yeah. in something, I need uh -huh. all of it. Like all know? of it. Yeah. New band or listen to this new bootleg. I'm going to listen to the new bootleg. Yeah, you know? definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can kind of be hurtful, though, to find a new band new music like i have a couple of friends that are like you know you're still listening to most of the same stuff you did when you were a teenager and i was mm -hmm. like yeah but i was listening to like the doors and the beatles and led zeppelin mm -hmm. when i was a teenager so you know. it, it's it's tough with music because like everybody finds what they like mm. but i suppose there is a difference i mean this is partially an excuse but it's a legitimate one i would say mm. where at this point in my life I am 
fully involved in music, whether it is playing live, writing my own songs, collaborating on other songs, being in the studio, playing instruments for fun, learning new things, that the actual window of sitting down to explore new music hmm. doesn't really exist for me. Right. You know, right. if I listen, if I listen to music for joy, it's because I want to listen to the music that I love. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I'm listening to stuff that I don't know, it's usually as a reference. Like if I'm writing a song with somebody for their band or their project, or if I'm producing something, it's like, what kind of vibe are you in? What do you, you know, you have any references? What are you thinking? What, what's the direction? Yeah. And music is music. So I can listen to it and be like, cool. I know the style. Mm. That's right. But what I will also say, which is not an excuse, is that 99 times out of 100, when I listen to these references, it's not like it's blowing my mind where I'm like, holy shit, I need to keep <laughs> listening to this. It's kind of like, yeah, I get it. Let's 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 write something cool. Mm. Yeah. You know, I, I wish I was just inundated with phenomenal music that I felt I needed to stop the world and just listen. But that has not happened in decades yeah i you know? was just going to say it's not something that happens very often nowadays with music yeah it's like all the best yeah. has passed and it's it's a real shame but mm. yeah you know yeah we'll um we'll get slightly more personal for the last couple of questions then Hit me. you don't need to get too worried mm -hmm. if uh <laughs> if um if you could I kind of, I probably know the answer to this. If you could see any performer from history in concert for one night only, who would it be? I'll let you answer the question. Led Zeppelin? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I have my reasons, though. I mean, I think in hindsight, seeing the Beatles, and this is a controversial statement, okay, right. would be highly disappointing because of two factors one pa equipment was not up to snuff mm. and they would have either been inaudible or sounded like garbage so mm. if you realize that let's say they were playing a baseball stadium that they were using the actual pa for the announcers <laughs> which yeah. sound like tin tin cans that would have been awful right so mm. if you have 2021 20, versions of you and i going back with what we know about a concert going experience yeah and we just see these four tiny spots in the middle of a baseball field <laughs> and you hear nothing but screams and maybe a semblance of sound yeah. that would be terrible the next disappointing thing is the beatles only played for about 20 to 25 minutes and most really? people don't know the yeah, most people don't know that I actually you know, didn't know that. Yeah, the, you know, Beatles, Beatles songs are fairly short. They play their singles. They would usually play on package tours with multiple bands. So mm. they would go up, I mean, at the most half an hour, mm. right? Yeah. Which is another thing for a, uh, I mean, half an hour slots are for the opening band that you don't want to see. And you're happy that they're only <laughs> playing for 30 minutes. Yeah. And five <laughs> minutes of those are spent figuring out technical difficulties, you know? So it's like, <laughs> it would be very disappointing. Um, on the other hand, you have Led Zeppelin, which um, would have played anywhere from two and a half to three and a half hours. Hmm. In which case, if I'm watching my heroes and what I deem to be the greatest band of all time, and, and I mean literally in the sense of the best four musicians who made a fifth element that is unequaled. Yeah. Three and a half hours would have been mesmerizing, you know? It's no but contest, will, really. Yeah. And, and I will say, though, if it was not Led Zeppelin, it would no doubt be Queen. Because to experience Freddie Mercury live, I'm sure would be magical. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Yeah. Um, if you could be locked in a room with any singer, performer from history, who would it be? Locked For 24 hours. Sorry. Because, you know, locked in a room... <laughs> That seems like kidnapping or like something <laughs> weird is going to go down. Um, holy shit. You know, that, I mean, it's a good question. It's a weird question. <laughs> um, 
I'm going to exclude Michael Jackson for obvious reasons. Good choice. <laughs> you know, I listen to Michael Jackson all the time. I don't want to be locked in a room with him for 24 hours. But then you are in your 30s, so. <laughs> I may be safe. Now, um, uh, you know, it's weird. It's like, I mean, I'm sure Freddie Mercury would be very fascinating. Um mm-hmm. Robert, Pl- I feel like Robert Plant and I would really get along because I know he's into history. Right, right. So I think that would, I think, I think um, quite a few beers and a few cups of tea could be shared discussing British history or something. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've had the absolute joy, honor, pleasure of meeting Paul McCartney a couple of times. I can Seriously. say... I can say he is, I mean, calling him a stand-up gentleman is an understatement, (laughs) but as, you know, being the greatest living icon of of music, Hmm. he couldn't have been any nicer. And having a conversation with him, it wasn't a guy who was like peering over your shoulder to see who else was in the room. Yeah. Or that guy, he was like, I felt I'm having a conversation with McCartney and I'm floored at what a what a guy he was it was really cool he comes um, across like that he seems like the nicest man in showbiz almost and like all the years of superstardom hasn't changed him from who he was before the beatles yeah and i think he's just like he's content obviously and mm. comfortable being that huge but rather than taking what I'm about to say in an egotistical way, I think he appreciates that everybody loves him. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually. not like everybody loves me because I'm fucking awesome, <laughs> which is true. Yeah. And if anyone's going to be an asshole, sure. Might mm. as well be the most successful living songwriter of all time. But I think he's just appreciative that billions of people love him. Yeah. Yeah. That's and true. like tr- truly appreciate what he's done for over 50 years. Hmm. So um, you know who would be fascinating, but I heard this could go both ways. Right. Sting seems like a fascinating guy to me. I feel like there could be a lot of stimulating conversation, Hmm. whether it be philosophy, history, psychology. He's a very... Very uh, multifaceted intellectual, but he That's also loves he loves chess, which I love, and I think we could eat up quite a few hours playing chess alone. Mm. So, you know, with giving this more thought, other than like who's my favorite, <laughs> I actually think I could make twenty four hours potentially pass by quickest with Sting. Right. We could play music. We could talk about many things, and we could play chess. That's a lot of, lot of time eating activity right there. Yeah, yeah. He actually, like, it would be great. And as you said, it could go either way. But he kind of comes across like he could be either like your best friend, or if he's mm-hmm. having a bad day, stay clear of him. He seems like yeah. he could be really grumpy and intimidating. And I've I've heard both. To be honest with you, yeah. Um, I don't. Uh, I'd love to meet him. But here's the thing. A lot of people are like, don't meet your heroes, which mm. I understand that. But, you know, I suppose if Sting was not nice to me, it wouldn't really affect anything because I am I would be prepared for it. Mm. Yeah, it's true. not like it's it's not like you have this image of this like angel of a guy <laughs> and your your perception is shattered because it's not what you expected. Yeah. You know, yeah. In which case, if I met him and he was just kind of standoffish or didn't give a shit about me or whatever, which, you know, why would he? <laughs> I'd be like, hey, it's Sting. Yeah. I'm going li- to go listen to the police now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually looking forward to asking you that question because uh, a couple of my guests on previous episodes, um, Eric Ferentino was for one of Rat. His answer was he'd love to be locked in a room with Trent and Nine Inch Nails. And see how that goes. Now he did say he'd need a lot of drugs as well, but we'll leave that out. <laughs> you know, if Trent likes you, sure, but I don't think Trent would want to be in a room with anybody for twenty-four hours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, 
You know, I, I think I think being a reserved and quiet, introspective person mm. does not lend itself to being locked in a room with another individual for twenty four hours. No, no, especially not someone who's kind of a stranger. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Good question, though. Thank you. And the final question is: If there was a song that could appear on the soundtrack to your life, what would it be? Another fascinating question, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I do try. <laughs> God, it's so shitty because I don't know the answer, and I'm literally like going through the rolodex of the three, four bands we've talked about this entire time. Um, I don't know. Right. It is one of them questions you kind of need to, you know, ponder for a long time. There's, um, uh, so like musically, I wouldn't say this song, but lyrically, um, it's one of the song, one of the few songs where I'm in like, that kind of describes a way that I feel. Right. Which is an odd thing to say because most people, um, especially people who are more into lyrics than say the music itself, find words that speak to them mm. and they can relate to. That's not very important to me pers as a listener. You know, I, I try yeah. to, I try to write lyrics in a way that can connect, but this is my long way of saying not this song, but lyrically <laughs> beach boys. I just wasn't made for these times. Okay. It is a song where I'm like, I often feel that way. And I don't that, you know, that's not to be misconstrued as ego or anything like that, but I genuinely feel at least for the time being, um, musically speaking, I mm. should say I was born at the wrong time. Yeah, yeah. For sure, for sure. I think there's a lot of people that can, can definitely relate to that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like, what's the song to your life? If I were to say, like, Cashmere, you know. Hmm. What does that have to do with my life? Nothing. I just love that song. <laughs> so, good question, but yet again, uh, not the best answer. I don't know. It was good. It was good. And as I mentioned at the start of the show, your song Talk, Talk, Talk will be playing us out. Would you like to just tell us a bit about it? Yeah. Um, as I said at the beginning, I do love the song. I'm very proud of it. Um, for those um, who don't know anything about me or this is their first introduction to me and having heard us go on about the Beatles and Queen, I don't think they'll be surprised to hear an influence of those two giants <laughs> in this song. But from a musical standpoint, there was a definitive effort and a sort of fighting back against the overly produced sterile music that is so prevalent today. Mm. There are so many songs that go nowhere that may repeat one phrase over and over and over again. The structures are boring, the sounds are boring, and it's almost the production itself that is the only thing carrying the song. So I was just like, screw that. I'm not doing that. I'm just going to sit at my piano. I'm going to write a song, and it's going to be traditional instrumentation, which is something I've always used, but I've always taken pride in a sort of hybrid approach of, yeah, bass, drums, guitar, with the occasional piano, but I'm going to mix in some sequencing and electronics since what have you but this yeah. was like no drums bass guitar piano i will write some string arrangements some brass arrangements and this will be a production in the traditional sense you know a, a production that comes from and i don't mean this to sound pretentious but a production that comes from a a musical knowledge yeah you know presets and technology are great but a whole lot of production comes from sifting through sounds and being like that's the sound and cool. doesn't matter how you get there as long as you get there, but that's very different to the production of say George Martin, you yeah. know? Yeah. And I was just like, 
I'm going to craft a song for the sake of crafting a, a, a work that I can stand behind that's still catchy, that's still well played, but the song stands on its own feet without any sort of exterior help. Hmm. The song is is built by the music. Its ornaments are harmony and, like I said, some light orchestration and some there's there's a bit of sophistication there and i don't mean that in a once again in a pretentious way or like this is this is thinking music it's not it's just what music used to be when say a pop band like the beach boys wanted to strive for something mm. they would then make their harmonies more intricate or stretch out their structures a bit more and same thing with the beatles i mean in queen that's the way yeah. these guys used to do it it's like, okay, we want to be popular. We want to be catchy. But how do we push the art form forward? I feel like people have not thought about that in quite some time. At least what is currently most popular. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, this, is, this is my reaction to I'm so sick of hearing mundane bullshit that goes nowhere and is reliant on production. So that's my rant about where it came from musically. <laughs> And lyrically, it's not hard to decipher that a lot of it has to do with impatience and just really wanting to move forward it, mm. in, in, in more ways than what. I mean, it's, it's left open intentionally and I'm kind of skimming through the lyrics in my mind. But it's like you've had enough with the status quo, but you're impatient about the pace at which you can move forward and kind of change things up. And the reason why it's called Talk, Talk, Talk is because, you know, the hook in the chorus goes, Talk, Talk, Talk has never been so cheap. Can't remember half of what I hear. Mm. You know, everyone's firing on all cylinders, but it's just really a bunch of white noise that you have to sift through. And yeah. then the following line alludes to, and another year has gone by and there hasn't really been any kind of hasn't been anything fruitful from it at least in 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 my experience my perspective and i need to somewhat retract that because i've had a lot of great things happen in the past year but okay. um a lot of this i mean i now a married man here so that <laughs> is a fantastic thing of course but um i just i feel like i generally operate from my distaste for things and things that i don't think are where they should be or as, as good as they should be. So when I write a song, it's like, God, you know, I'm so sick of hearing this. I'm going to write yeah. this, yeah, you know, or, um, and at the time when I wrote it actually, which was pre pre engagement, pre marriage. So I can kind of get away with, with what I was saying <laughs> sooner. <laughs> there, there was plenty of just like everyone's full of shit. I mean, we all know that we, mm. we live, we live in a world where we spend most of our time staring at one screen or another. And what we are looking at is other people trying to project their vision or their image of their reality, which is nine times out of 10, a fabrication or an exaggeration. And often enough, these are the kinds of people who have an uncanny ability to communicate to millions of people and then as this sort of trend grows and more people kind of get sucked into this vortex of nothingness, it's just, it's, it's exhausting. Yeah. You yeah. know, so it's like time genuinely feels like it is traveling at a faster pace than ever with less to show for it. That's, that's how I feel. And while all of this may not be obvious in, in the lyrics, these are the kinds of the things constantly you know like pinballing in the back of my brain that that yeah. inevitably caught in lyrics so yeah well it's amazing to actually you know have a musician nowadays who doesn't want to just stand in line and follow the rest you know release the same crap music all the time yeah. who actually puts their soul their energy their thoughts into the song you know and cares so much about the lyrics and you know, as you said, it it means something, you know? Mm. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, I, I wish it was as simple as just blaming 
lazy musicians or songwriters. I mean, you're always going to have those. Hmm. But, and I don't mean to be the, uh, you know, fight the man kind of guy, because that's, that's not where my statement is about to come from. But I do feel, you know, I'm giving you a micro tangent right here. <laughs> but I do feel that analytics have become an enormous problem for music because music is clearly subjective mm. and usually, or I, I shouldn't say usually, but for the longest time, the music that you found out about was the music that at some point started out with somebody believing in it and then a company getting behind it to sign it, record it and distribute it. Right. Yeah. So you, in a way, were aware of what was put out for you or promoted for you. And then that kind of stemmed out into different formats and genres and all that stuff. And of course, there have always been indie labels, which put out other things. And you have all those um, aficionados and people who are always on the hunt for things that weren't the biggest band in the world. Yeah. And great, all the credit to them. And you would think in theory that being able to say, anybody out there can put out music, which of course that's great. Hmm. Anybody can distribute music and doesn't need a label. Of course that's great. But when you can track everything, the element of believing something is reduced to almost non-existent. And the confidence in investing in something has to do almost entirely with what the data is showing them. So at this yeah. point in time, Labels, for example, are interested in things that are already streaming well, things that are already doing well, in which case they just see this is already doing well without us, but with our money, it should be it, – it's a safer bet for them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it sucks because nowadays with TikTok, you can have some – nonsense makeup challenge or dance challenge or whatever the fuck it is. And yeah. because there's a song in the background that people may find catchy, if that video gets a million, millions of views, and as a result, people start liking that song, it doesn't even matter if that song came from somebody who's not even an active artist or pursuing music. It's mm -hmm. like, we need to find who this person is because millions of people already like it and we can capitalize on it. It's like yeah. you're so everything becomes about what is already proving to be sort of tested in the market without having any money invested into it. And then they just see how they can push that along further to make their jobs easier and make easier money. But as we all know, Quick money is quick money and long-term money is the stuff that will pay for decades. If mm -hmm. you find the right act, the right band solo artist who actually has what it takes to sustain a multi-decade career. Does the song in this talk video have that? No. <laughs> and if I'm wrong, I will retract that statement, but I would be willing to bet almost anything that you're not going to find that. Mm from TikTok or some viral artist. And uh, that's not taking away from viral artists per se, because if it truly is something great and that's why it's going viral, then awesome. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's a real shame that everything has been reduced to numbers. Like I, 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 I would, I would also bet almost anything that a label and our guy would look at numbers before they'd listen to music. Without a doubt. Oh, you know. Uh, which, which is, I mean, that's really the the most um, concise way of summing up what I just ranted about. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. And it really speaks that to those guys, the music doesn't matter. They don't care at all about the yeah. music. You know, it's only the numbers and how much money they'll make back. Yeah, there's no there's... risk involved with them in taking, you know, taking a risk on a, an unknown band, a band they've just found. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes it harder for the guys, you know, the guys that could be the next Beatles or the next mm. Led Zeppelin, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, the, and the irony is that these bands that were were signed because of how great they were are the back catalogs that are financing a lot of these people to this day, which is, <laughs> which is, which is, which is the irony. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, uh, 
it's unfortunate. I hope uh, the table turns in, in, in some form or another that is beneficial to the musician. But um, it's really tough, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Well, I know you're a busy man and uh, we've got through all the questions. <laughs> well, I, I do appreciate it. I am going to head out to rehearsals, but it was a real pleasure. And thanks for taking the time. Welcome to the podcast, concerts that made us, interviews and stories, tales from the bus, we love taking you back to when it all went down, the greatest live shows and that cheering crowd sound, it's concerts, concerts that made us, concerts that made us.com. Cool.